Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webcast. I'm Amy Pendergrass with Moss Adams, and I'm going to get us started for today's session, Strategy and Tax Considerations for a Business Transition. Before we begin, I'm going to play a brief video. Welcome, and thanks for joining us. We're pleased to present another in our ongoing series of continuing professional education webcasts to help companies and individuals conquer challenges as they plan for what's next. Our presentation will start in a few moments. Before we begin, here are a few things to keep in mind. You can customize how you both view our presentation and interact with the presenter. For better viewing, close all other applications and turn up your speaker volume. You can also adjust window size and placement or enter full screen mode using the controls at the top of the window or dragging the bottom right hand corner to resize. At the bottom of your screen, you'll see a series of icons, each relating to a different aspect of our session. You can download the group attendance sheet and a PDF copy of today's slides from the slide deck and handouts widget to the right of the slide view. You can ask our presenter questions during the webcast by typing a question in the Q&A window below the slide view and clicking submit. We'll do our best to answer all questions during the presentation or follow up via email. If you experience technical difficulty during today's presentation, refresh your browser by hitting the F5 key. Today's session will offer you one CPE credit. To receive credit, you must meet the requirements as specified by the National Association of State Boards of Accountancy. You must attend at least 50 minutes of the session and respond to at least 75% of the polling questions, which we'll ask throughout today's presentation. To respond to a poll, click the button next to your answer. We'll track your progress and alert you when you've earned CPE credit. You can then click the certificate icon in the CPE Progress widget to open a PDF file that you can save to your computer. Don't worry if you can't download your PDF certificate today. We'll email a copy to you in two weeks. If you're attending this webcast in a group, you must complete our attendance sheet to receive CPE credit. The attendance sheet is available in the slide deck and handouts widget. Please have all group members sign it and send only one sheet per group. Also note that CPE credit can be awarded only to participants registered as themselves and isn't available to participants who view the on-demand version. As a reminder, the presentation you're about to see isn't legal, investment, or accounting advice. We encourage you to seek the counsel of a professional service provider to apply this content to your specific circumstances. And now I would like to introduce our Moss Adams presenters for today, Sean Keneally, partner, Aaron McFarland, senior advisor, and Jose Romero, Director. Their bios and contact information are located in your webcast console if you would like more information. And now I would like to turn the floor over to Sean to get the presentation started. Great, thank you. Thank you, Amy. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, as, as Amy mentioned, I'm a partner in Moss Adams uh, deal advisory practice, uh, specialized in M&A tax. And uh, it looks like just uh, to kick off here before we jump into the sort of meat of it. Uh, Amy, I think we have a polling question. All right, so we can get our first polling question out of the way here. It is, what industry are you from? Construction, architecture, engineering, construction materials, or other? And we will give you a few moments to respond. Uh, to respond, please click the button next to the answer you choose and hit submit. And if you cannot see the submit button, you will need to enlarge the slide area. And it looks like everyone's pretty quick this morning. So here are the results. Right. Yeah, it looks like a uh, vast majority in other, at least of, of the respondents. So with that, I won't uh, I won't belabor um, deliver the results. I think that you know what we're talking about really transcends industries in many respects. Um, you know, and, and focuses on um, overall exit strategies. Um, you know, and considering uh, how ownership chooses to exit a business. You know, one thing I want to highlight before we jump into it, we're going to focus on three typical types of exits, you know, either outside transactions, you know, the typical traditional M&A, uh, management buyouts, 
or family transition and succession planning. But but I wanted to just touch, you know, before we push into the details of that and say, you know, each transaction really has its own set of facts that will drive the ultimate structuring and, and you know, tax consequences of the, of the transaction. And, and so – while you know we talk about this in general terms, I think that you know every everybody's facts uh, have their own individuality to them, and you know not not to sound like uh, a you know shill or a sales pitch, but um, you know just highlighting that you know trained trained deal advisors um, can help with you know aspects of a transaction that most people who don't do a lot of deals, don't don't tend to think about or expect. Uh, and even people who do a lot of deals uh, oftentimes can be surprised at the things that uh, a trained deal team uh, can can address. Um, you know, I think that just to touch on it really quick, the big thing um, when you're thinking about selling a business or transitioning is avoiding surprises. Um, you know, in, in this context, surprises are generally not ever good. And, and so, you know, a trained deal advisor is going to be able to give you a buyer's perspective on um, your your transaction and your tax file profile, so that so that you know you have a sense of what obstacles um, you know may lie in, in wait for you before you before you enter into that transition, um, and, and can help uh, address the historic you know, tax positions, remediate, um, and, and can find a tailored approach to really um, accentuate your value drivers. Uh, for your particular business, collaborate with your, you know, other deal advisors, your bankers, um, lawyers, auditors, return preparers, things like that, to to really foster uh, an efficient and effective deal process um, from from a tax perspective and from a business perspective overall. And, and then I think the one thing that people don't think about until they they do some transactions or uh, do probably one transaction is is that. Uh, it can be a second job for the management team, and, and having the right uh, support structure um, from your advisors uh, can minimize that burden, so that uh, the management team can continue to be focused on their day job. So, with with that, um, you know, uh, again, I'll say that the areas of focus, you know, to jump back to the slides, um, you know, the, the the first would be an outside transaction, typical uh, M and A, whether that is a, a sale, um, an investment. Uh, or, or a combination of the two, you know, to monetize the value of the business. Um, you know, the, the real key areas of focus involve one, you know, transaction readiness assessment and, and some pre-transaction due diligence, which touches on, you know, my my comments about uh, avoiding surprises, um, focusing on the tax positions um, that might interfere with a successful transaction, um, and then and then finding the appropriate way to either remediate those issues and you know, go in and fix it uh, or, or alternatively tell the right story around it to potential buyers so that they understand um, the, the, the practicalities uh, of, you know, uh, things that are either endemic to your business or, or that, you know, may on, on their face um, present, present challenges. And then ultimately, you know, as, as the transaction progresses, uh, in that in that outside transaction, um, you know, you're going to need tax advice with respect to the actual transaction structure itself. Um, meaning, meaning, you know, whether you want tax to roll over, whether it's 100% sale, um, impact of um, things like uh, preferred stock uh, for an investor, or um, you know, carried carried interest, uh, profits interest, things like that. Um, advice on the deal uh, documents themselves, you know, tax provisions of any of the agreements, and, and modeling, you know, which, um, you know, oftentimes is where the rubber hits the road, uh, meaning that, uh, you know, run sample tax calculations under alternative scenarios uh, in, in order to, you know, give the, the seller and, and the buyer a negotiating position um, and an understanding of the economics of the transaction from a tax perspective. Transaction readiness, as, as I said, you know, really is focused on really identification of potential tax issues. Um, you know, I don't think uh, I, don't, I don't think I need to revisit this too much, but you know, like I said objective commentary is that buyer's eye that uh, that I mentioned. Um, again, you know, issue identification and remediation. Um, you know, it really focuses on 
how to how to either fix or posture um, the tax filing profile and the history of your company um, in order to to uh, you know as as noted support deal pricing uh, avoid exclusion from equity warranty insurance. Uh, which is, you know, obviously becoming more and more common and, you know, turns into sort of a second due diligence in and of itself, um, you know, reduce indemnities, escrows, holdbacks, you know, really uh, effectively uh, affording you the opportunity to avoid having tax um, diminish your um, proceeds in in a transaction. And I think most critically here, uh, it, it helps the seller control the, the process and reduce disruption by having those unpleasant surprises crop up uh, during the deal process. Uh, again, uh, some typical things we see as far as uh, transaction structuring, modeling, and you know agreement support uh, is uh, helping understand the potential tax costs and benefits of, of structures that may be available. Oftentimes, there are more than a single structure, um, and there are benefits to both the buyer and the seller of exploring alternative structures. You know, uh, have a step-up transaction where a buyer gets the benefit of revaluing the assets at, at fair market value, so that they can depreciate and amortize um, those those assets over time at, at the fair market value rather than its historic value. Uh, that that may come with a tax cost to the seller, and so negotiating on the front end for a gross up to equalize you know the additional tax costs. Um, resulting from the buyer getting benefit is, is you know, critical. Um, and then understanding what potential gain triggers might occur in the transaction as well. Overall, uh, also pretty um, important to being thoughtful. Uh, I have worked on deals where, frankly, the seller, um, the seller, you know, enters uh, a transaction with, uh, you know, sort of full advice. And they tend to go much more smoothly than a transaction where, um, you know, insufficient advice or, or representation, if you will, has, um, you know, been involved and issues arise you know, the day before closing or signing, which, uh, which can then delay closing and signing. And I have seen it kill deals on, you know, very rare occasions. So, um, you know, with that, I think, you know, just considering cash, cash tax impact of proposed alternatives is going to be critical to being thoughtful regarding um, these outside transactions. Um, and, and so, you know, with that, uh, I think you know, there, there's some hot topics that uh, have been coming up uh, more and more, uh, especially in the context of potential increasing uh, tax rates. And, you know, one of those um, that uh, you know, we obviously see a lot, and I think uh, many advisors, both personal financial advisors and tax advisors and business advisors are bringing up, of late is the qualified small business stock uh, strategy. And so, Jose, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to, you know, talk through, um, you know, sort of the generalities of that. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, so this is uh, Jose Romero, a director here at Moss Adams. I sit up in Seattle. Um, Sean, I guess before we jump into these topics, we did get a question um, you know, based on what you just went through, um, you know, is it better to sell stock or assets uh, as a general matter? Well, so I don't know if you want to kind of give overall yeah, thoughts on that. It, it, absolutely, and I think that goes to that goes to that last slide we were just talking about. So I appreciate that question. Um, I, I think that, as I said, each each transaction really does have sort of its own personality to it. Um, but you know, I, I think in, in general terms, if you sell stock, you tend to hand over the business with all of its sort of liabilities and, and assets and things like that. Uh, if you sell assets, um, the, the assets exit the business, but uh, the seller retains the, um, you know, business history and, and responsibility for that business history and tax filing history and what have you. I, I think typically, you know, in, in very simple terms, sellers generally prefer to sell stock and, and buyers generally <laughs> prefer to buy assets. Um, and, and the way deals get done is you find, um, you know, the, 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 the best middle ground on those two when, when you can um, so that, you know, neither party bears uh, an unreasonable uh, burden uh, in, in the face of the amount of benefits that they receive. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Sean. I, so I think this is a good segue into this um, qualified small business stock 
um, for, you know, I guess let me go through the, the background on, on some of the benefits and then, you know, kind of a, you know, some industry issues. So this is something that's been coming up more lately. Um, just, you know, you know, I, I've been dealing with it a, a bit more since, uh, you know, recently, I think maybe since the tax rates went down, um, you know, a couple of years ago. Uh, so what 1202 provides is that it actually, you know, if, if you sell, if, if you create a, a C corporation, so it only applies to C corporations, there, there'll be some requirements in the next slides. There's quite a few of them, by the way, so we won't belabor all the requirements, but let's just say there's a lot. Um, you know, so if, if there's a C corporation and you sell stock, what can happen is you actually can have zero tax on, on a gain, the greater of $10 million or 10 times the adjusted basis uh, of what basically what was invested into the company. Um, so for example, if you know, there was 2 million invested, then you could have up to $20 million gain excluded under this provision. So it's a pretty favorable provision and then that there's zero tax on that gain. Um, so, you know, we've been dealing a lot more with this provision lately um, one thing I guess that you know about the industry, I know this is uh, you know it looks like there was some other a lot of responses that there's people in other industries, but in terms of the construction, hospitality, real estate, and kind of professional services, you know one, you know one of the requirements is that it must be an active business, and the type of business cannot be one of the following. Uh, and then these, this is kind of uh, you know a lot of technical. This is straight out of the tax code. You know if you fall under one of these businesses you do not qualify. Uh, so I guess for the audience, you know, the, you know, just to note that, you know, the businesses that relate to the performance of services, you know, engineering, architecture would be excluded, and then also leasing and investing. And then on the last bullet, you know, operating a hotel, motel, and restaurant are excluded. Um, you know, if it's a business kind of outside these areas or, or that's maybe like, you know, related but doesn't relate to services. For example, you could have like a, you know, a doctor's office that has software, you know, where that was part of the business. You know, we, we would need to look into that um, to see whether that, maybe that the software side is most of the value, right? And that may bump it up to 80%, for example. So, I mean, it's a pretty complicated, you know, we need to dive into what exactly the company is doing to see if, if, if you qualify, but this would be a, a major gating item. Uh, for most companies. Yeah, and, and Jose, I think, you know, just to add a little color here, I mean, I think uh, to the extent people aren't, you know, fully familiar with this, um, it, it really, if you qualify, uh, this is a great benefit. It, it is tax-free gain uh, on the sale of the business, and, and because it's tax-free gain and because, you know, frankly, the, the government, the IRS, does not like to sort of give give away uh, tax benefit for free, it, it does require a pretty onerous uh, qualification process. And, and so, you know, as, as you'll see, you know, it's, it's kind of an eye chart, um, but there's a lot of, you know, sort of subtlety and complexity to it because at the end of the day, you're, you're getting free, the tax free gain uh, as a result. Yeah, thank you, Sean, for that. Uh, yeah, so this is some of the other qualifications, and you know, this is not like the only uh, you know qualifications. There's some other issues outside of these that need to be looked at. Um, as you see, you know, there's quite a few here. Yeah, and um, and we do we have a question that kind of touches on this, um, you know, regarding how long it might take for an S corporation to switch for a C corporation, and then. Um, you know, be a C corporation that would ultimately be eligible for, for QSBS. And, and so, you know, I, I will say the, you know, a couple of thoughts on that. One is, you know, as you see here, it has to be, you know, that C corporation stock is acquired at original issuance. So you, you need to do some structuring. It can't just be sort of a, you know, I'll say a conversion, um, in order to, uh, result in, you know, becoming a C corporation. So you have to do some structuring to get that original issuance. Um, and generally, although the, the, the rule is, you know, a five-year holding period, there is a component under active trader business that um, it has a uh, substantially uh, all uh, holding period requirement. Uh, and, and substantially all is, you know, as you'll see, you know, sort of noted, um, generally 80 percent. And, and so, it, you know, as I hate doing this as a tax person, but we do this a lot. Uh, it does it does depend on how long. 
the S corporation was an S corporation before it, um, you know, was ultimately uh, turned into a C corporation uh, to determine what the what the holding period is. I'd say, uh, you know, at a very minimum, it would be that five year holding period, and likely, likely more to make sure that 80% of the time uh, it was a you know qualifying small business. All right. Um, let me see. And then, uh, yeah, I think we touched on most of these, but, uh, you know, we don't need to go in, into each of these requirements. But, but let's just say, yeah, there's a, you know, a decent amount of analysis that needs to be done um, to see whether, you know, you would qualify. And, you know, you also may need to run some modeling on kind of, hey, what does the, the zero uh, tax mean versus your current structure? You know, like, you know, you could potentially now you have to sell stock. Like as Sean mentioned a little earlier, buyers want to buy assets. So a buyer may not give you the full purchase price, you know, if you're going to sell them stock, for example, right? So there's a lot of like pros and cons. Um, this is, a, you know, the, the, the major pro here is that you pay zero tax up to the greater of the 10 million or 10 times your investment. But then, you know, the buyer may push back on that or may want to buy assets, for example. So. Okay, so then let me see the, the, the next topic, uh, the, the sale of personal goodwill. Uh, so this is actually, I think, would be, much more relevant to the, you know, construction, hospitality, real estate, and kind of, you know, the industry group that, you know, we're covering here. Um, so, the, the, yeah, so this is the the idea is, okay, well, what's the goodwill at the entity level versus what's the goodwill at the at the personal level? Um, so, so this, you know, I guess maybe before going in, you know, th this applies for like, you know, like it, it provides the most benefit to a, Kind of a founder um, owned business or, or, or a person at, at the management level that's a partial owner or wants to get some sort of consideration at the personal level that has been you know very involved with the company um, and has you know strong personal relationships with the customers you know the idea is that you can kind of carve out a piece of the business and you know that's considered personal to that to that person and that doesn't really belong to the company. And where you get the most benefit is that if you have a C corporation, um, I'm, I'm here at, at, at the bottom, right? If, if a C corporation sells the assets and then the buyer is going to get the full benefit, you know, uh, because most buyers want to buy assets, it, it's pretty costly. It, it's, you know, 40% uh, tax plus, you know, the relevant state rate. If you sell personal goodwill and that asset is already sitting up at the, the personal level outside the C corporation, it's just the capital gain rate. So that's just 20% plus a relevant state rate. Um, so, you know, we're talking about a 20% difference in taxes if we can move part of that goodwill up to the personal level. And, and if you have, like, for example, a, a, a you know, founder-owned business that's, you know, close to 100%, that's you know, a, a straight tax savings to, to the, you know, kind of the, the sellers there. Um, so, you know, the, the, what the, this is from, well, well, I guess what brought this, um, you know, it, what got people comfortable with kind of splitting up the goodwill is this Marn ice cream case from back in 1998. And I'll, I just want to speak a, a, a bit um, to it, you know, kind of because this is what, you know, some of the gating items are. You know, in that case, there was like a father-son, you know, the, the father owned 51% and, and, the, and the son owned 49%. And, and the father, it was like a Haagen-Dazs um, distribution relationship that he had with Haagen-Dazs. Um, and the father got some direct consideration to sell his relationships. So he was saying that that's personal goodwill at his level, not the company's. Uh, so they went to court and, you know, the court agreed that that was – his personal goodwill because the father had these relationships. And then the key item is that the father did not have a non-compete with the company and also didn't have, you know, any sort of employment agreement. So, you know, theoretically the, the, the dad could go, you know, start his own company and, and do the distribution business for, for Hagen Dawes and the company wouldn't be able to stop him. So I mean, that's one of the, the first questions that I ask when people are, you know, potentially, considering, you know, selling personal goodwill is like, oh, do you have a non-compete currently with the company or an employment agreement? Because sometimes the employment agreements will have a non-compete provision um, within that. 
Um, but yeah, if the answer is no, then I think and the next uh, kind of question is, okay, well, how valuable are these relationships and how long have you been kind of, you know, operating the business? And, you know, a lot of times we can get to, you know, a good percentage of the overall business. And, you know, it's a valuation question, but, you know, you could easily get to like, you know, 10% of the value um, there and move it up to, to personal goodwill um, and maybe even higher, you know, depending on the business. So I'll stop. I'll stop there and um, see if there's any questions. Let me see. Okay. So then, yeah, we'll move on to the next topic. Uh, yeah. So I think th this this idea will be much more relevant to this industry group, um, and you know, could potentially save quite a bit of taxes. Um, okay. Oh, we got a polling question, Amy. All right, thank you. So our second polling question, are you considering making a business transition? A, yes, in the next 12 months. B, yes, in the next 24 months. C, no, or D, I don't know. And I also want to remind the audience uh, to submit your question for the presenters using the Q&A window. And we do have quite a bit of content to cover today, so if we don't have time, to respond during the webcast, we will do our best to follow up with you afterwards. And we will leave this up another five seconds or so. Okay, here are the results. Okay, so it looks uh, like mostly no. Um, the second, I don't know. Um, yeah, but there is a, a few yeses, you know, in the near term. So, all right. So let's go on to the next topic. Um, so this is another issue with, you know, I guess you know when exiting and, and selling the company, and that I wanted to bring up. This is this has been coming up lately with our clients. Um, not necessarily, you know, we don't do this, but I just wanted to, to, to flag this, that there's, there's some promoters that have been telling, you know, our clients or, or other people's clients that, you know, we hear about and then we get questions about it, that are, are marketing this idea that, you know, a seller can, can kind of use this, this monetized installment sale concept where, you know, essentially that the seller would defer the gain or part of the gain to, to the future period, for example, like, you know, under the normal tax rules, if you get kind of like a, you know, 20 year payment or, or, you know, you get a payment beyond the, beyond the year, the sellers don't have to pay the tax until they get the cash. So, so the idea is that, you know, you can go out there and sell your business and, and, you know, get like a 20 year note, for example, like let's just call it a, a balloon note in 20 years. So in 20 years, you finally get the payment from, from the buyer and that's when you pay the tax, right? So theoretically, you can defer the tax. And then where the kind of the, the, the kicker comes in is that in the meantime, the sellers can go out there, take that note, and go to a bank, you know, and offer, offer it as collateral and take out a you know, 20, um, you know, the, the purchase price today and just pay some interest. And then theoretically, it kind of all washes. So they have the use of the cash today and they don't have to pay the tax until much later. That's kind of what's been kind of brought up to a few clients um, for tr for regular transactions. Um, so there's a couple of issues with this. Um, one is that you know the IRS does charge interest on an installment note over five million, and the second one is that you know if if a taxpayer pledges the the note to a bank and to obtain a loan, that's considered a sale. So there's a prohibition on pledging that note for cash. And then there's also an interest charge. You know, this, this does work, um, by the way. So, so what, what prom the, the promoter, I guess before I go there, the promoters are, are relying on this IRS. You know, it's a non-presidential, by the way. So you can't rely on it's, – it's, it's just a memo that outlines the, the position that the, the IRS had on some specific facts that were brought to their attention. Um, it, it's here 2000, uh, from 2012, and here's a reference. 
that gets out of these issues above. However, you know, that, that memo is specific to farm property. So, so farmers get an exclusion from these last two rules on, on the, the $5 million, you know, like limit, and then the pledging requirement. Um, so they get a break. Other people don't. So unless you're, you're kind of a farming business, you know, related to, you know, ranching, plantations, or even the related structures for farming, then you can't really go and, and get a, a loan and pledge your note and not pay and, and pay the taxes in 20 years. That, 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 that's yeah. pretty aggressive. So. And, and Jose, I, I, you, know, I, you know, I think that that's, that's probably critical to understand. I have seen promoters, um, you know, market this uh, in, in a whole breadth of contexts and industries outside of the farm property context in the, in the chief counsel memorandum. Um, the promoters will point to the chief counsel memorandum and say, look, at, you know, it's, it's not precedent. You couldn't go to tax court and, and, and put it out there and say that, hey, this decision uh, allows us to do this. But they say, you know, it, it's indicative of the, the government's thinking uh, on, on this issue. Um, I, I will say that, you know, conversations with, you know, people at the IRS and things like that um, is it, absolutely uh, in their mind only, you know, limited to those circumstances and facts in in the, the memorandum. And, and probably just to highlight, you know, um, you know, when we refer to promoters, we're really referring to people who may be marketing um, this transaction structure. And, and it, you know, as a result, um, I, I think you have some concern where there may be a heightened focus uh, from the IRS with respect to market the transactions. So I just wanted to highlight that uh, as well. Okay. Um, all right. So then uh, the next topic um, is um, this, this one is, is, you know, uh, pretty common, um, you know, using an ESOP to kind of like, so when you wanted to transfer, for example, to, to employees, um, there, there's quite a bit of benefits. Um, to, to doing that. Uh, so one of the requirements to get, you know, some of these benefits is that it needs to be a sale of at least 30% of the company. And what the seller can, can do is the seller can actually take those proceeds and roll them over into tax and bonds and then invest them and not trigger the tax. And, and then over time, the, the employees, uh, the ESOP kind of would own 30%, for example. So then from the earnings, the, the ESOP could pay back uh, you know, the, so the ESOP can go out and take a loan, right? So there's a lot of, like, you know, e e economics that need to be worked out, but the ESOP can go out, take a loan, pay it to the, to the seller um, for the 30%, and then over time pay off the loan from the earnings of the company. And then the company can also, you know, make tax deductible contributions to the ESOP, and then that can also be used to pay off the loan and interest. Um, by the way, the, the ESOP is, is kind of like a qualified plan, uh, from a tax perspective and other kind of regulatory perspective. So, so you know, my understanding from those qualified plans is that, you know, the IRS does issue kind of a, uh, like a letter saying you're a valid ESOP. So from a tax perspective, once you get that letter, then, you know, one of the benefits of, of using an ESOP is that, yeah, you, you're comfortable that, hey, the, the ESOP qualifies, therefore this whole idea qualifies. And, you know, one of the major things to keep in mind is, is you know, I, I guess where I've seen or heard about issues popping up is if the value of the company is too high, right? Like the cash flow may not be enough to pay off the loan. So, so the value of, you know, what, what the that, that, that the parties are coming up with is critical and then also making sure that the economics work um, for this. Um, the last point is here, you can also use this idea with S corporations, um, the, the the gain can be deferred, uh, but there's some other kind of benefits on the S corporation side. Um, since you know the, the the ESOP would own an S corporation, and, and the the ESOP itself doesn't pay taxes currently. Um, so yeah, this is just something that you know another way to to kind of transition ownership to employees. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. Um, yeah, this is related to the value one, and not just for ESOPs, but just in general. Um, something that, that has come up a few times, um, you know, well, com often comes up in a sale to management is the, what's the value of, of the company, uh, right? It, you know, it, it, if there's a, some sort of discount, this is where you get into 
kind of trouble or, or kind of need to think about it, you know, if the value is too low, the IRS is going to automatically think that it's a gift or compensation. And if it's a gift, it has a lot of like estate tax issues. And if it's compensation, then that means that, you know, the, the employee has to pick up that as ordinary income and then the company needs to withhold. Um, you know, the IRS doesn't like gifts to employees. Um, there's actually, you know, quite, quite a bit of, of case law here. And, you know, you have to jump through some hurdles. Um, you know, you need to basically have disinterested generosity under, a few, you know, under case law. Um, you cannot, you know, if there's any connection to kind of prior services or future services, then the IRS, the IRS is going to say that that's compensation. Um, so it's just something to be very careful about is, you know, kind of the value that, you know, the employees um, would pay for, for a buyout of the company. Okay, so let me go on to the next one. Um, oh, yeah. The, yeah, the other one, uh, kind of idea that, can be done is using a profits interest. Um, you know, they, they, only, they only apply to partnerships, by the way, not, not to C-Corps or S-Corps. Uh, however, you know, you can restructure an S-Corp or, or C-Corp, kind of like drop the business down a tier and then, you know, kind of form an LLC and bring in the management at that lower level. So there's ways around it at the S or, or C-Corp um, well, with companies that are S or C-Corps. Uh, but, you know, you, you, you would need to uh, restructure. Um, and then the benefits of that is that, you know, profits interests are, are not taxable um, when issued um, to, to the, you know, the, the, the employee or whoever you're issuing the profit uh, interest to. And then the, 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 another, you know, big benefit is also when they, the employee sells, then it's a capital gain upon a sale at 20%. So you, you get out of the compensation side by being – you know, 37%, you know, you're dropping the, the rate down to 20 and then also don't have to worry about it being immediately taxable upon an issuance. Okay. Um, uh, something pretty common is, is um, when you don't know the purchase price um, is to do an earn out, which is kind of based on, you know, a few milestones like revenue, EBITDA, net income. You know, this is kind of a win-win for both sides because then, you know, the sellers get, get more compensation and the buyers don't have to worry about, you know, the, how the business is going to do in the future. Uh, and then the sellers don't, are not taxed until the earn out is received. Um, so then just one thing to, to watch out for, because it comes up all the time, is if the sellers need to stay on and provide services, even if they're not directly linked to the, you know, kind of the, the milestones, as, as long as they have to just stay on to receive the earn out, the IRS is going to, you know, say, argue that it's for compensation. Um, so we need to be, you know, I, I guess clients need to be very careful there in, in trying to tie the sellers to stay on because that could, you know, uh, convert the character back to compensation to the sellers. Yeah, Jose, I think this is, this is a great tool uh, for, for a couple of things, right? As, as you said, where, where a seller, you know, um, you know, believes the, the business has a higher value um, than, than the buyer believes, uh, it's a great tool for the, the seller to be able to prove that value through performance of the business. Uh, and, and it's also a good tool to, to make sure that from a buyer's perspective that the seller transfers the know-how and, and things like that that really reside with the seller's team um it, it, to the buyer uh in an effective and, and productive way as you said though the challenge is that uh the drafting has to be very careful um in, in order to uh, avoid uh turning what would otherwise be purchase price into uh compensation to the individuals that that are you know attached to the earn out and there's there's a whole list of factors there's not a bright line test that says it goes one way or the other way um, but you really have to step through the totality of it and, and, and see what the agreement looks like. And it's always helpful um, to, to make sure that the attorneys are, are teaming with, you know, the tax advisors, uh, whether it's, you know, their internal tax, you know, uh, attorneys or your external advisors to, to really get to the right answer uh, on this while it's being drafted. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I think uh, uh, the next section is, is for Aaron and um, in terms of the, the personal planning.
Thanks, Jose, and uh, good morning, everyone. You know, I think we spent a lot of time uh, kind of up until now talking about how to maximize business value. Um, but I think it's, it's important that we pivot to maximizing value as assets flow to an owner's personal balance sheet um, through a transition because there's a lot of value that can be captured there as well. And, you know, I think it's critical to do personal planning in parallel with that business planning. Um, that's always important, but I would say it's even more critical to do that personal planning now because the, the wealth transfer opportunities that exist today may not be here in a, in a few months or years. Um, and, and these opportunities really exist for two reasons. The first is the estate um, and gift tax planning opportunity um, in, the, in that arena. And the other is structure planning and, and, the, and all the things that go in with to, to structure um, um, for where assets go. So we'll, we'll talk about both of those areas. Um, but before we do, I wanted to just kind of start with some general key questions we see owners asking themselves as you know, they work through um, a business timeline. And then we'll, we'll talk about maybe outlining a decision-making framework on the personal side and really kind of outline what the action steps are there and how to make those steps tangible. So what we're looking at here is, you know, kind of at inception, the, the obvious general questions are, how can I make this business into something sustainable? Um, and is now the time to invest capital? In the growth phase, you know, the questions really are centered around, should I distribute profits to shareholders or reinvest in the business? Um, when can I stop putting capital in? When do I get liquidity? You know, what influence will this have on some of my personal plans? Um, and, and at maturity, which is kind of where we're spending a lot of our time today, it's, it's really um, question centered around how a sale would affect me and ultimately are the earnings real and transferable? Um, I would say the last set of questions we typically see are around family business and, and, um, and you know, the sale is internal, then, then the questions are often around personal values and how those can be carried forward in the business. So, you know, as a, as a transition becomes more imminent, um, it's really critical to look at how an owner's personal goals can be affected and start to build out this framework for making decisions on the personal side. And at the 35,000 foot level, it's really evaluating how to structure assets in, the, in a few different buckets. And there's really a huge amount of value that can be gained by doing this. And, and we'll kind of look at what that value could be. Um, but when you think about it, assets can really only go three ways. Uh, in the future. They can be consumed, they can be gifted to family or charity at life or at death, or they're going to Uncle Sam, and again, at, at life or at death. Um, so the, the long-term game really is how does an owner optimize each of those buckets, both in terms of structure and kind of overall risk return of the assets that are held there. Um, you know, and, and more tangibly, how does the process start? It really starts with evaluating the current balance sheet um, of the owner, analyze kind of what's generating cash flow, and conduct some financial modeling uh, to answer a few key questions. Number one um, is the, the, the obvious one. What current assets should be held for personal consumption? You know, and how would you structure incoming assets from a, a transaction to kind of meet further consumption needs? And number two is, um, with the remaining assets, how do I structure them in a way that maximizes their value for my philanthropic, family gifting, and overall legacy goals? And that's really where we're seeing tremendous opportunity right now. Um, you know, ultimately, if, it, if an owner has an estate tax exposure, then this current environment uh, provides for, you know, once, maybe twice in a lifetime opportunity to maximize that tr the transfer of that wealth. And we'll get into that shortly, but um, wanted to quickly pivot to our third um, polling question. So, Amy, I'll turn it over to you. All right, thank you. So, our third polling question is, what type of business transition are you considering? A, outside transaction, B, management, C, family transition, succession, D, I don't know, or E, not applicable. 
And as a reminder, if you would like to receive CPE for today's webcast, you will need to respond to at least three of these polling questions. And once you've completed all CPE requirements, you will be able to download a PDF of the certificate uh, from the CPE progress window that's in your console. And it looks like most everyone has had a chance to respond. So here are the results. Kind of a kind of a mixed bag here, um, which is kind of what we expected to see, um, given the nature of the you know everybody attending. I think um, whether it's an outside transaction or an inside transaction or, or anywhere around um, you know any sort of transaction, the estate planning considerations for owners I think is is really important across the board, and and um, so I want to kind of show you why that's important. So, you know, there are a couple key reasons why a significant wealth transfer opportunity exists today. Um, the biggest one and, and the obvious one is that the federal estate tax exemption limit is, is significantly high. And today that limit is 11.7 million a person or 23.4 million per married couple. So what that means is if you pass away with an estate value under those limits, then you don't owe the government any federal estate tax, although you could owe some state estate tax. Uh, but to the extent you die with an estate valued above that limit, then you would pay tax on the asset values above it. And the tax is pretty significant. It's a, you know, a graduated scale that hits 40% when the estate exceeds these limits by more than a million. So we, we arrive at that 40% fairly quickly. Um, to put this in context, because I think that's important of why this is a good opportunity now potentially, you know, in 2010 through 2015, this rate was $5 million, around the $5 million range for an individual. Um, from 1997 to 2014, this exemption bounced around half a million to three and a half million. So it's pretty high right now. Um, and, and there's talk of, you know, the new administration lowering the exemption to three and a half to five million a person, um, although there's kind of an argument on how fast or aggressive they may be in getting it through. Um, but regardless, under current law, the current exemption will sunset at the end of 2025 and be cut in half. Um, also, the, the top bracket is slated to go from 40 to 45 percent. So, so, you know, pretty good chance we could see these limits go down either way. And, and really, the opportunity that exists today is that an owner can potentially lock in um, this high exemption amount today by transferring assets into a vehicle outside of the estate, no matter what happens in the future on the exemption amount. And so the, the, the other piece that's material there is that that separates the growth of the investment. So if you move 23.4 million into a vehicle and it grows, you know, for, for 20, 30 years, then that's not under the estate either. And, and, um, and, and that's pretty significant. A couple other reasons why this is a unprecedented opportunity right now, you know, the low rate environment provides for an ideal time to do intrafamily loans and, and, you know, that allows for assets to appreciate outside the estate and also gives the recipient a greater delta kind of between the growth of that investment or asset and the rate they pay back over time. Also, some illiquid assets are still quite depressed, um, given we're still in a pandemic. So you can give more value using less of an exemption for certain assets. And then the final piece here is discounts on transfers of minority interest. There's a lot of talk about limiting those discounts in the future. So the, you know, I would say naturally the kind of no-brainer strategies for, for folks that have an estate tax exposure is um, first to look to give low basis and high return assets so the owner doesn't have to pay tax and the growth is outside of the estate. And second, um, to utilize the annual gift exclusion and the, the deal there is that any person can gift a value of $15,000 per person annually to anyone without gift tax implications. Um, to the extent that you gift over that limit, then the gift will reduce the overall estate tax exemption um, in the future. So the, the gift tax and estate tax are, are tied together in that way. 
Um, but if you're looking to get money out of an estate, then, you know, both of these um, items are, are really important. So, Jose, maybe I'll turn it over to you real quick to kind of comment on some of the potential changes under the Biden administration. Okay, hey, thanks, Aaron. Um, yeah, so there are some potential tax increases. I'm sure you guys have heard about it. Um, you know, the, the corporate rate, you know, is proposed to go up to 28% um, after 2021. And then the individual rate is proposed to go up to the old uh, highest tax rate of 396 and then, uh, you know, the 3.8 uh, net investment income tax would also be broadened and apply for people that make over 400,000. So effectively, the highest rate could go up up to 43.4%. Um, you know, on the capital gain front, you know, we're talking about going up from 20 all the way up to 43.4% in the worst case, right, for people that make over a million dollars. And then, you know, section uh, 199A, which offered, you know, the 20% deduction and, and lowered the 37% down to 29.6. Uh, now that would be phased out for people that make over 400,000. Um, you know, the, the, the carried interest um, would go away also for people that make over 400,000. So this is more from like, a, um, for, for people that, that do the, make their living from investments you know, that, that they're in a, an investment services partnership. It's kind of a defined term, so like hedge funds and private equity. Um, that goes away for them. Um, but then I think overall, you know, it may go away for everybody if the capital gain rate goes up for those that make over $1 million. Um, so as you see here, you know, there's just, you know, rate increases across the board uh, under Biden's proposals. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I'm not sure, you know, kind of, I guess, that on, on the handicapping you know, when and whether these are going to become effective, where that will end up. I mean, we're talking about politics here now, um, but these are just some of the proposals here on the individual and corporate side. And then Aaron, and the next one is on the estate side. Yeah, th thanks, Suzanne. Um, in the interest of time, I won't go through every single one here, but I will highlight the ones I think that are going to, could potentially be significant. The first is, is the obvious one, the estate tax exemption potentially going down to three and a half million a person. The second, um, and this one is huge, is the step up in basis. There's a lot of chatter about this. And, and again, I don't know how likely it is that this gets through, but there is a proposal to eliminate the step up of cost basis at death so that the recipient would need to pay tax on the sale of an asset. That could be very material given, you know, long timelines and high rates of return on various assets. Um, the other is the grantor retained annuity trust. These are, you know, these are tools to get dollars out of an estate, but for the owner to collect an income stream before passing. And they're talking about potentially increasing the minimum from two to 10 years on these trusts. So if you die before those time frames, then the money is taxed at your estate level. And, you know, jumping from two to 10, there's quite a bit of morbidity rate um, risk when you increase, um, you know, that minimum timeline. So those are, you know, those are some, some key ones uh, to watch for. On the charitable side, you know, opportunities exist there too um, and important to look at prior to a transition or a transaction. You know, I would say that the biggest tool we see used is the donor advised fund, you know, to the extent that an owner is charitably inclined. It's the cheapest, uh, provides the most flexibility, and can be the it, it can be kept confidential. So all really good things. Um, and the way it works is you give assets, which are typically appreciated stock, uh, to the fund that you manage or someone else manages, and you lock in the tax deduction in the year the assets are transferred. Um, uh, but what's nice about it is you can invest the fund and gift the charities out of the fund at a future point. Um, so you lock in maybe a deduction up front and make some decisions on what charities to give to in the future. Private foundations are, are also something we see um, from time to time, but they're very costly and less flexible, uh, require you know, a lot of time and energy and, and are not always confidential. Um, and then charitable trusts. Uh, charitable trusts, there's all kinds of them. Essentially, um, whether it's a lead trust or a remainder trust, the idea is that the person um, can collect an income stream um, from, you know, from the trust or um, a charity can, can um, receive an income stream from the trust 
and then a beneficiary may receive it at the end if it's a lead trust or um, or you know the charity may get the assets at the uh, at the death of the person who starts it. So some really good tools. You know, one area that I'd highlight, and this is tough to do sometimes, but it's really effective when it can be done to the extent that the owner um, is charitably inclined, and that's you know really consider gifting some ownership interest to charity prior to a transaction. You know, and, and the the obvious benefit of that is um, the growth of the business value is outside of the estate. Um, so there's some huge value if it can get done, but again, it needs to be done well in advance and sometimes can be difficult to do. So with that, uh, Jose, I'll turn it back over to you. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so we're running short on time, so I'm just gonna mention kind of what's on uh, some of these slides. You know, here's just a, a listing of, of some kind of you know the once a transaction goes through the, the you know the work is not done there's a lot of things that that need to be done on a post transaction um you know after the deal's done so here's some kind of some things that you know may need to be done um to kind of resolve some issues uh and then the the next one is that you know this is a question we often get is like hey what what type of entity is best from a tax perspective so here we've kind of highlighted some of the you know kind of pros and, and cons here be between the, the C-Corps, S-Corps, and partnerships. Um, so then, yeah, so we'll go on to the, the polling question, so we have enough time for that, and then uh, and then Amy can wrap it up. Um, so here we go. Polling question, Amy. All right, so our last question is, what exit consideration concerns you most? Timeline, taxes, readiness, post-transition sustainability, or not applicable. And then also for those of you that would like a copy of today's slides, you can download them from the folder that says slide deck and handouts. And we'll also be sending them via email tomorrow along with a recording of this webcast. And we will leave this up for another five seconds. Okay, here are the results. Okay, yeah, so it looks like uh, people are, are pretty concerned about taxes. So I think you came to the, the right webcast. All right, so then, um, yeah, I think we're, we're pretty much out of time now. So, a Amy, I think we'll just turn it over to you. Um, I mean, we can skip some of these slides here. All right, yeah, uh, unfortunately we are running out of time. So thank you, Sean, Aaron, and Jose for a great presentation today. And thank you to our audience for your participation and for submitting all of your questions. If we didn't have time to answer yours, we will do our best to follow up with you after the webcast. Also feel free to reach out to our presenters if you have additional questions. And this was our last session in the Business Transition webcast series. So if you miss any of the sessions, you can view them on demand by clicking on the link found in your console. If you met all CPE requirements, your certificate is available to download now in the CPE progress window. I will keep the console open for a few minutes to give you time to download. And a copy will be emailed within three weeks if you have difficulty downloading it now. And finally, here is a link to an online survey for today's presentation. Please take a moment to complete this survey as your feedback is very important to us. Thank you for joining our webcast and we hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, thank you everyone.